this episode, I'm joined by Predorad Chikovacki, who is a professor of philosophy at the College of the Holy Cross. In this episode, we discuss the work of Nikolai Hartmann, primarily from Predorad's book, The Analysis of Wonder, an introduction to the philosophy of Nikolai Hartmann. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support Medics or gain access to some exclusive content, or we'll just keep everything running, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Predorad Chichkovatsky, thanks very much for joining us on Medics podcast. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we're going to be discussing the work of uh, Nikolai Hartmann, uh, primarily from your book. I've t- taken inspiration and influence for the questions primarily from your book, The Analysis of Wonder and Introduction to the Philosophy of Nikolai Hartmann, which was published 2014 by Bloomsbury and then republished 2015 in a paperback by Bloomsbury, of course. Um, as we've been discussing before we started recording here, Hartmann is someone who, uh, yeah, criminally overlooked um, in certain places throughout the world, but generally, you know, a figure that a lot of people might have just about heard of, but very overlooked. Um, perhaps you could, some might consider him a phenomenologist, maybe others would consider him uh, an ontologist. Um, many people would perhaps understand him in relation to personality, uh, but all these ideas are really coinciding within in his work. We'll get into the, the, the depths of this soon. Uh, but before we begin, Predra, just um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how your interest in Hartman came about and why it was you were asked to write this uh, extremely accessible book on Hartman. Thank you. Um, I got to know Hartman uh, virtually at the very beginning of my philosophical career, my philosophical studies. Um, it was in former Yugoslavia in Belgrade, where several people were still impacted by the ideas of Nikola Hartmann. Uh, one of my old professors was a student of Hartmann. Several of them were students of Hartmann's students. So uh, some of Hartmann's works, there were actually more of Hart, many more of Hartmann's works in translation into Serbian rather than into English. Uh, I think at that time there were only two books uh, translated into English: Hartmann's Ethics, a uh, big, huge uh, book of two eight hundred and fifty pages, uh, and a short, popular book, supposed to be popular, New Ways of Ontology. Hartmann's kind of summary of his own um, of his own philosophy. Let me just mention that Hartman is not equally neglected in the rest of the world. Uh, in Spanish, for instance, you can find virtually the translations of every one of his works. Uh, he is still known in Germany, even though the influence of Heidegger was enormous. And we can talk about it a little bit later, why Heidegger rather than Hartmann and maybe Gadamer later on. Interestingly, Gadamer was first a student of, of Hartmann and then switched to Heidegger. So was Hannah Arendt. Uh, so there were these uh, kind of historical circumstances that uh, led to the fact that uh, Hartmann was neglected later on. Uh, so I got to know Hartmann really uh, from my get-go, so to say, of my philosophical thinking and studies, and then was very lucky that when I came to the United States to do my PhD on Kant's critical pure reason, my teacher was Louis Weidbach, who himself was a student of Hartmann in Germany in 38-39. He took a a year-long course with Hartmann on Kant's critical pure reason. So, and that was my primary interest at that time. I spent a good 15 or so years of my life uh, studying Kant, <laughs> every line that Kant wrote. Uh, so so Hartmann has always been with me, and I still consider him one of the most important philosophers. Uh, this will sound like an overstatement to many of uh, our listeners, but I consider Hartmann as one of the most important philosophers in the entire history of world philosophy, especially Western philosophy. Mm-hmm. Well, there is about three or four different things that I want to touch on there, especially Heidegger, because Heidegger's, uh, I don't know, maybe it, it doesn't frustra- frustrate you as much as it does me, but Heidegger's overshadowing of philosophy and all that were just ar- seen as around him instead of the thinkers in their own right is a is a big bugbear of mine. But um, before we jump into these, uh, these ideas, uh, which I'm excited to come back to, I do have to ask you the Hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? And of course, Nikolai Hartmann is already there 
waiting for these three to enter? Well, one has to be Plato. Uh, one has to be Kant, for sure. I think both Hartman and I would agree on, on these two. Mm. Uh, and since we're talking about Hartman, I would say that he would pick um, Aristotle as the first person, as the third person, and maybe Hegel waiting uh, <laughs> uh, in in a room next door, just in case one of these three got fatigued by a serious <laughs> philosophical discussion, and we need uh, reinforcement. Mm. I mean, those. So, that's the five. That's well. That's okay. Here's the question, and that's four heavyweights of philosophy. I mean, undoubtedly, the most four of the most important philosophers who ever lived in curating that room are you are you personally putting Hartman on par with these four no i wouldn't put him on par with these four i uh, i have to be honest and say uh i mean these four are really heavy based <laughs> and i agree with you uh however we want to rank the philosophers of the past and whatever our individual preferences and, and backgrounds are I would say that at least three out of these four have to be uh, on anyone's short list of, of the most important philosophers. So these are heavyweight. I, I don't think Hartman's there, but uh, but uh, I would put him maybe second, third layer, definitely. Uh, so not too, too far behind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's such a, an all-encompassing conversation, though, because it, could, it really could go over. I mean, this is a conversation about philosophy and really about truth. I mean, do you think there is a common philosophical thread where they would all, I mean, of course, Plato, Aristotle, you've already got that relationship, but where they might all say, look, this is, this is what we're talking about? That's a good question. Uh... Uh, philosophers tend to disagree about everything, so they would probably disagree about that too. Uh, just think about the two of them, uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, these are two different temperaments. These are two different approaches to philosophy. Uh, obviously, they had a lot in common. They were both Greek philosophers, very fundamental. We all know that Aristotle was hanging around Plato and for, for a good 20 years. Uh, but uh, I think they are as different as 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 different can philosopher as philosophers can be. Uh, so very different approaches, temperaments. Uh, I, I think Hartman has an element of both, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of strange. Uh, even Kant has elements of both mm -hmm. uh, of both Plato and Aristotle, and and in and in a sense, if if we, um, the successors of these great philosophers, if we ignore entirely one or the other, despite our uh, philosophical temperaments, I think it's at our own peril. Uh, for instance, I would personally much prefer Plato to Aristotle, but Aristotle was so foundational in so many things that you just cannot skip over and say, well, I don't particularly like this approach to philosophy. I have a friend who... Who, who calls Aristotle the greatest librarian of the Western <laughs> philosophy because he classified everything, put everything mm. on a proper shelf, gave it a name, a catalog number. Uh, but Aristotle did much more than that, and we have to agree on that. Um, Hartman, since we're talking about him, um, had this poetic side of him that... Uh, comes out here and there. Uh, it's not as 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 um, visible as in Plato, obviously, where that's the core of, of Plato's philosophy. You cannot separate the form of of Plato's expression from the content. Uh, but uh, Hartman was at least on the first uh, on the surface more like Aristotle than like Plato. Kind of systematic, uh, detailed. Uh, never missing a never missing a single detail of anything, able to dissect any topic into its subparts and further subparts and further divisions and ever tiring of it. And when Hartman went through something like Aristotle, you can be sure that nothing was left out. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that every single detail that could have been discussed was discussed. So there was there was something a little bit of that. In Hartman, even though he believed that 
the age of philosophical systems is over and mm. that it's pointless to try to build a philosophical system, that there are philosophical questions. Uh, and maybe that's the, the one thing that unites Plato and Aristotle and Kant and Hegel and, and Hartman, that they all believed in the uh, perennial philosophical questions, in the deep philosophical questions that that persist throughout the history of the humankind and that we have to address from our own point of view, with our own knowledge, from from our own age and wisdom and foolishness of our age, but we have to address them over and over and over again. Uh, so maybe that's one thing that they had, that kind of leaning toward that perennial philosophy, which is not very popular today, as hmm. we know. <clears throat> No, no. I mean, was it just to sort of historically situate Hartman? Was it, you know, how popular was it in his day? Had it fallen? I mean, it still isn't particularly popular, as you say. So, was there somewhat, somewhat of a maybe a resurgence of it then, or was it was he really on his own with uh, understanding philosophy in this way at the, that point in time? Look, uh, he was very well recognized in his time. Uh, he was teaching at the philosophy at the um, uh, University of Marburg, where Heidegger was. Uh, later on, moved to Berlin. Uh, then, then was in uh, Cologne with Max Scheler for a while. Uh, um, the position in Berlin was considered perhaps the most significant. The Humboldt University in Berlin was considered perhaps the most important uh, uh, philosophy position in the entire Germany at the time. For about ten years, he was the president of the German Philosophical Association. And you don't just pick anybody to be a, <laughs> philosoph a president of the Philosophical Association. He mm -hmm. participated in the World Congresses uh, in Harvard. I think it was uh, 1926 or 28, and in Oxford the next one five years later. Uh, so he was he was uh, he was known uh, in Germany and and definitely outside of Germany as well. He his ethics was translated only five years after it was published in in Germany. It was translated into English. Um, so he was he was well known, but. But there was one thing that, that that turned other people away from him, other mm -hmm. philosophers away from him, and that was that he did not belong to any particular school of <laughs> philosophy, that he did not want to identify with any ism in philosophy. Uh, uh, you go back, I mean, the, the, the main activity of, of Hartman falls between... Uh, 1921, when he published his first major book on the metaphysics of knowledge, till his death, 1950. So these are three decades uh, of his of his very um, you know full philosophical activity. Um, that's the time of existentialism, for instance, right? That's the time of uh, phenomenology that is influenced by who Searle then later on different people and and Hartman knew all of that um, and he uses the term phenomenology and he thinks phenomenology has uh, a role to play in philosophy of which we can talk a little bit later but he definitely uh, thought that, that existentialism is going in the wrong direction, uh, that existentialism, psychologism, different kind of relativisms, hermeneutics he didn't think much about. Uh, so there were all these kind of things that uh, movements, <clears throat> if, you, if you want to call them, that he did not think much about at all and he did not want to and and maybe another another thing that annoyed people is that when they were publishing book reviews of his books or critical essays about his work he did not engage in a polemic with anybody he simply let those uh views stay for what they are without trying to defend himself or show that they um that his positions were misunderstood or anything of that kind uh he, he simply did not engage in those kind of discussions he he believed he has more work to do and he concentrated on his work and what he what he envisioned is is his life work and uh, just ignored how people responded to his philosophy do you think that that in part that has led to some of the 
you know, some of the fact that he's been forgotten is, is because he didn't enter into that sort of typical academic to and froing between. So he didn't end up a philosopher's philosopher. You know, he was his own guy. Didn't end up in the dialogue and the debate where you're going back and forward and there's all this. He just, you know, I admire that though. That's definitely, I admire it too. That's definitely part of it. Um, another important part is that already from the end of the 19th century, philosophers have been talking definitely after Nietzsche, with Nietzsche and after Nietzsche. Uh, philosophers have been talking about the death of metaphysics, the death of philosophy. And and what is Hartman doing? He's dedicating most of his life to metaphysics, to ontology. <laughs> uh, so, so Hartman... Everybody else is burying philosophy, not just six feet under, but six miles under. And and, and Hartman is saying, no, we cannot have philosophy without uh, the deepest ontological considerations. Uh, it's, it's foolish. It's like uh, trying to build a, a building without foundations. Uh, any first wind that comes will just blow it away. Uh, and so he he was doing something that was not popular in in, in that time. He was he was doing something, dedicating his work to something that 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 the philosophers of his age did not consider necessary anymore. Why talk about being or being as being when Heidegger says we have to talk about Dasein, we have to talk about the meaning of being, and Hartman would say, how can you talk about the meaning of being when you don't know what being is? Uh, so so he he simply was not part of these conversations and he simply did not see the world uh, there was another important element that i should add to this picture because even most con uh, hartman scholars forget about it or underappreciate it um and this is connected with hartman's um biography or personal history if you want hartman was born in riga uh, so far away from Germany, right? That it was part of Russia at that time. Uh, and Hartmann's first philosophical studies were in St. Petersburg. And he was part of a circle that uh, he was, as a student in St. Petersburg, he was attending the meetings of the intellectuals like Berjaev and Lossky and, and, and people like that. And one of the reasons why I want to emphasize that is that Russian philosophy and Oriental philosophy in general cannot take seriously a certain voluntarism, to call it that way, that is so prevalent in, in, in Western philosophy. The role of the will, the role of what I want and what I can do is considered very, very serious, very uh, uh, as, as limited, far more limited than we do. Uh, let me just give you one illustration that can help perhaps you and your listeners understand what I'm talking about, or, or two illustrations rather. One is that um, about 70% of sentences in Russian are impassive, okay, versus English or passive is barely tolerated mm -hmm. or not tolerated at all, as I learned on my own personal experience when I came to the United States, because in my native language, most of the sentences are impassive, and my professors were just correcting me all of the time. Uh, I think that has an impact on the whole metaphysical picture, uh, uh, that the language we speak, the language that's our native language, impacts our uh, understanding of the world. In in the active English world, you expect that you can always change things, that you can modify things, that things happen because you want them that way or somebody else wants them that way rather than this way. In Russian, in some other languages, most Asian languages, uh, things happen to you. The world is bigger than any one of us. We are part of the world rather than the world there to serve our interests and purposes. Uh, so when you have a metaphysical picture that's coming from that kind of language, uh, it is the metaphysical picture that includes the inevitable limitations uh, on what a human being can do and what the human being can change. And think about it. Uh, 
Is it my choice to be born or not? No. Is it my choice to be born in this family rather than that family? No. Is it my choice to be born at this age rather than that age? No. Is it my choice to be born in this country? There's so many things that are not our choice. Mm -hmm. Yet in our Anglo-Saxon world, in our Western world, we, we, we focus everything on what I want and what I can do and what I uh, desire to do and so on, rather than on things that simply happen to us that we are kind of placed into and that we have to adjust ourselves to rather than the other way around. The world is not, the world is there to serve our purposes and, and, and to, um, to be used by us for the satisfaction of our needs. And that's not the picture, the metaphysical picture that Hartman comes from. Yeah. Uh, let me also mention one other example why I think it's also important that, Cart that Hartman's first kind of influence in life experiences are from that part of the world. Uh, I don't know what your background is and how much you know about Russian philosophy, but one of the important things in Russian philosophy discussed even today, but especially around the turn of the between the 19th and the 20th century, is the role of intuition, the role of intuitive grasping. That has disappeared in Western philosophy. Descartes still talks about intuitive knowledge, but very soon that intuitive knowledge is reduced to irrelevant. Uh, what is important and what, our, say, our Western epistemology is about is justification, proofs, evidence, uh, uh, to the point that it's really not the truth that we are after. It's the justification and evidence that we are after. Well, if you have a conception of knowledge that heavily relies on intuition, what happens is that you can grasp the truth by means of intuition, by means of intuition without having any evidence for why this is so. You simply know it. You simply feel it. You, you simply uh, get it, uh, right? You, you get it or you don't get it, even though you can't offer any evidence for it. Uh, so Hartman comes from that part of the world, and he has never repudiated the role of intuition, for instance, mm. uh, whether in uh, ethical discerning of the values that, that we are facing, or in thinking about what we need to do, or in with regard to the aesthetic values. And he also never repudiated the role of feelings, mm -hmm. uh, which is also something that disappears from Western philosophy, right? We are rational beings and nothing but rational beings hmm. who can reason and argue and prove and justify and so on. And, and you see, so Hartman already, from his starting premises are kind of different, uh, annoying uh, for Western philosopher and, and rejected by most Western philosophers. Intuition, forget about it. You know, what does intuition have to do with philosophy? What is the role of intuition in philosophy? Zero, nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Give me an argument, right? Mm -hmm. Show me your premises and, and let's see whether they lead to the conclusion or not. <laughs> what does intuition have to do with that? Uh, so, and, and that's a very strong part of Hartman, right? That he had this incredible intuition and he relied on. And oftentimes, for instance, in his ethics, he offers an analysis of about 42 ethical values. But he doesn't tell you where he get these 42 values. Why are they related like the way they are related? Uh, what is the proof that there are only these 42 values and not another 42 values that are more relevant or as relevant? He just does he just feels them. He and he says values are discernment of values is based on feelings. Mm -hmm. It's about feeling of value. Mm -hmm. And he calls this a priori feeling of value. So intuition is also an a priori discernment of something before you have full experience of it. You just get it. You just feel it. Just like I had the feeling that you and I will get along fine and have a nice <laughs> philosophical conversation without ever meeting you. Uh, it just a, a kind of that kind of a uh, you just feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Hartman has that. Uh, which, which doesn't belong into our conceptual apparatus at all. So was he was he a religious man? Was he was did any of this have a relationship with God? Because often often 
you know, philosophers, when it comes to things such as intuition and these 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 feelings, often what what happens is people will subsume this into some sort of theological system of its own. So they sort of have this panicked, well, we still need a system, so it must be something to do with God. Was this something something else? Was this almost philosophy for its own sake? You know, philosophy speaking on its own terms for Harman. No, he was not a religious man. That's what's interesting, right? Mm. Um, yeah, you read Berjaev, and, and this is all religion, right? This is all how do we come closer to God, and, and much of that Russian philosophy is about that, right? Um, Hartman did not believe in personal God. Harvard, Hartman was agno- an agnostic. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said that he could not see any reason, and... Uh, to, to believe in a personal God. He criticized his uh, friend, uh, Mark Shaler, for believing and claiming that God is a person and personality and all of that. Uh, but Hartman thought that there's much to learn from Christianity and other religions. So he was not a religious man, never went to church, uh, mm. would have been a Protestant had he been a religious, would have been a German Protestant. I think his uh, mother was very religious, a pietist. She was a pietist. But he did not uh, believe in religion. And it's interestingly, at the end of his ethics, uh, he has a, a chapter on the difference between religious ethics and and um, and just philosophical ethics. Mm-hmm. And how there are certain things in uh, religious ethics that you assume, take for granted, that you cannot do in philosophical ethics. For instance, there's this value of purity. Mm-hmm. Uh, just being pure, being pure as a person, being innocent, being sincere, being believing, and so on. And and Hartman says, just to give one example, Hartman says, if you lose that sincerity, if you lose that honesty, uh, you can never gain it back, right? Once you lose your purity, your, your almost kind of moral virginity, if you want, you can never get it back, right? But in religion, that's possible. God can make you pure again, right? You can regain that purity and you can regain that thing. Uh, so so he, he thought that there are certain incompatibilities between religion and, and ethics. But he thought that, on the other hand, religion can teach us a lot of things that we as philosophers have forgotten. Uh, let me give you two examples. I think... I mentioned uh, earlier how Plato was important for Hartman. And I think what Hartman shared with Plato and with all the religions of the world is certain devotion toward the highest and the noblest and the best. Uh, Our life has become so practical. Our life has become so concerned with usefulness and efficiency and material goods that we kind of lose track of something that could be called sacred, not necessarily in a religious sense, uh, something that is sublime, again, not necessarily in a religious sense, or something that just high, that can serve as an inspiration for our entire life. Uh, Hartman said that religion has it, religion has preserved it. Of course, it doesn't have to be concentrated in the person of God, like in Christianity, right? You look at the number of Asian religions that don't have, like Taoism, that doesn't have any personal God. And yet there's that certain awareness of something, devotion to something higher mm. that uh, that Hartman believed is indispensable for a meaningful life, indispensable for a meaningful life. Uh, the thing, the two things that are specifically uh, important in Christianity that Hartman emphasized in his ethics are one is the value of suffering and the value of brotherly love. Okay. Uh, now, the value of suffering may be a little bit puzzling because suffering is something bad and evil, isn't mm. it? Right. Uh, but and Hartman did not want to deny this that especially above a certain limit, suffering is just pure evil and, and contraproductive. Mm. But he said that suffering is necessarily necessary for moral maturation, that suffering is the test of, and, and our response to suffering is the test of our humanity, that there's perhaps no better test to our humanity 
then are we running away from any suffering? Are we just stuffing ourselves with any pill whenever any problem comes or, or some other kind of escape? Or can we take it head on and accept that suffering is a necessary part of life and, and an important part of life and that in suffering and in and kind of honest confrontation with suffering, uh, we can actually grow as human beings. Uh, and he thought that Christianity, with its with its emphasis on on suffering, right, that that it has doing us a service. It has reminding us on something that is, in uh, our secular life is usually considered just negative and something to run away from. And and Hartman also thought that the importance of brotherly love is 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 something that we can teach, that we can learn from uh, Christianity, because. We focus too much on justice and rights. What are my rights? What are my privileges? And Hartman thought that that this this language of rights is too negative. Uh, don't infringe upon mine. Nobody can take away from me the right to vote, right, or the right to express myself, free speech, and so on. But but. What is it that I want to vote for? And who is it that I want to vote for? And am I really informed about what am I voting uh, about? And and, um, and and Hartman thought that justice is it can be kind of a cruel virtue if it's not supplemented by sympathy, compassion, brotherly love, and and the value of other human beings that they're just not okay, this is my Let's say car. That's your car, right? Mm. This is my uh, shirt. That's your shirt. You you wear your shirt. I'm wearing my shirt, and that's it, right? Uh, a brother would give a shirt to his brother, right? The brother would take away from himself and give it to to the brother in in need, and and so by emphasizing that. Hartman disagreed that this is the fundamental value or the only important value, as sometimes Christianity makes you believe. I'm teaching at the Catholic college, so uh, we are all men and women for others, uh, mm. even though we have to be for ourselves too. And maybe it's good as a contrapose to that society of obsessive idealism where all I care about is, is myself. But but this is one of the values, one of the fundamental values, but by no means the only one. So so Hartman is using religion, borrowing from religion, even though he's not religious himself, and 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 he thinks that religion can still remind us of the of the certain aspects of the secular life that are sorely missing and that are actually, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're missing from our lives. Mm -hmm. So to, to sort of jump back to this idea of ontology, which is obviously one of Hartman's clear focuses, I mean, it's sort of the big question then in relation to this way of living. Um, he, he doesn't want to constrain what it is to be in the sense that Heidegger does in relation to like Dasein. He doesn't want philosophy. He doesn't see philosophy as something which should be constrained to this justification or this, well, what is existentialism ultimately is the question of beginning philosophy from the point of view that we matter in some already predefined sense. So for de Hartmann, uh, sorry, Hartmann, the, you know, the question of ontology then is simply one just of being, you know, not of being in a certain way, not of being X, Y, or Z, not of, I don't know, Dasein of self-reflective being, it's of just being. But how can he begin to philosophize about being in that way or ontology in that way without bringing it back into this sort of systematic Heideggerian way of thinking? Yeah, very good question. And now we are turning into kind of an opposite side of Hartmann, the Aristotelian side of Hartmann, <laughs> because uh, we've seen kind of maybe this platonic, poetic side of him and what he can take from religion. But now we are going back to word common sense and science, uh, which was also important for Hartmann. After all, we are being among other beings. We, we live in a reality that, that's been here before we were born, and it's going to continue being here long after we are gone, even the even the entire human race, long after the human race is gone, the world is going to be here. Uh, we have every reason to believe so. So in that aspect, uh, Hartman very much took our kind of common sense and and scientific understanding of the world into account. Uh, in that aspect, 
he was very much a feminologist, if you can uh, go back to that uh, word. Why? Because simply open your eyes and see what's around you. Uh, let's try to make a certain kind of a catalog of, of, of being, so to say. Uh, let's look at the reality. And Hartman recognized that there are kind of four layers of reality or four layers of being, if you want it. Um, the most basic one uh, is the are the material things. Uh, this is something that's just not organic, the inorganic uh, matter, right? This is part of everything that we can see around us, that we can touch, that we can manipulate, and so on. Uh, in addition to this inorganic layer, um, there's the layer of the organic. There's the uh, something like a plant life. Uh, this is a life that has no consciousness in, in any kind of sense of consciousness that we would normally use in our in our common sense right um so so the second layer is life that is not the human life that is not even the animal kind of life uh that has no psyche that has no soul that has no psychological experience that we for instance definitely want to affiliate with animals uh anybody who has a cat and dog uh, knows that uh, they're capable of very many different a variety of psych psychological experiences uh from recognizing the owner coming home to uh, letting you know that they're hungry or that they are hurting or, or, or all, all kinds of things. So the third layer is the organic life with consciousness. And Hartman thought that there's a fourth layer that we can also uncontroversially recognize. And that's what we usually associate with human being, uh, which, which Hartman says, in, who in addition to consciousness have spirit or, or spirituality, have spiritual um, and this could be, in a minimal sense, understood in a way that, for instance, Leibniz and some of these early modern philosophers understood, not only that I can be conscious of the world, but I can be conscious of myself as being conscious of the world. So um, it's kind of self-consciousness and, and uh, the ability to reflect on our experiences of the world and consciousness of the world. And this is where maybe uh, we should mention Hegel a little bit, uh, who's who's also waiting for us impatiently in the next room to be uh, uh, brought into discussion. Hartman kind of borrowed the uh, understanding of spirit that's not religious in any way. It's not the spirit that comes descends from the have from heaven or or from above. It's a spirit that kind of grows on the inorganic organic conscious basis. Uh, this is just a novelty that's coming from below, something that's growing from below. That's what Shaler uh, had a similar conception. Uh, there was a big discussion between Martin Buber and, and Shaler, for instance, about whether the spirit descends from above or whether the spirit is something that simply grows from, from below. And Hartman followed uh, Shaler. So like Hegel, uh, Hartman distinguishes a personal spirit, uh, the spirit in you and the spirit in me that we can call personality. Uh, then there's something that's the objective spirit, the spirit of our time that you write a lot about in your blog, right? The spirit of, of our time is bothering you. Uh, uh, it, it's provoking you into thinking, into searching for something different. Why are we like uh, the way we are, right? This is, uh, and we can talk about our collective spirit, global spirit, but we can also talk about the Western world, the Eastern world. We can talk about England and the United States, but there's a spirit of a certain place and time. Uh, but there's also any, another interesting category that Hartman called the objectified spirit, also following Hegel. Uh, and the objectified spirit is the spirit that's been institutionalized in a certain way, not just in terms of, say, law uh, or courts and schools and education, but also language, right? It's been, it's a spirit that's, uh, we were talking earlier about the difference between Russian and English, for instance, right? It, it's something that's objectified in the grammar, in the syntax, uh, in the expectations dealing with, with that kind of language. Uh, so this is what the real world is like for Hartman. And how, how do you ignore that? And how do you not 
So talking about Dasein, we can talk about Dasein, but only after we understand what this Dasein is, so so to say, standing on. Mm. This Dasein is just like the upper floor of a building, and it's very funny and inappropriate to talk about the upper uh, floor of the building without understanding what the floors below are and what the foundation of that building are. So that was, that was the direct discussion between him and Heidegger. Um, There were, there were actually a lot of um, references without, without explicit references in both Zion and Zeit uh, in Heidegger against Hartmann and the other way around in Hartmann's ontological work without uh, references to Heidegger and criticism of Heidegger without mentioning Heidegger. But it was going on for about 10 years or 15 years until they kind of gave up on each other. Um, <laughs> there was also a, a an anecdote uh, that was told uh, by the students in Marburg at that time. Um, Heidegger was an early person, early bird, early riser, and, and Hartmann spent the whole night working. Hartmann didn't go to sleep before six o'clock. So they were several try, several times trying to uh, arrange a discussion uh, when they can meet. I don't know if you're aware that uh, occasionally Heidegger was started teaching his classes at six o'clock in the morning. That's can you rare. imagine that's, that? That's very Heidegger, though. That's typical yeah. Heidegger. Six o'clock in the morning and then and, and, uh, get into the um, Plato sophist in Greek, right? Uh, I don't know if you'll be ready for something like no, that. No, not at that time in the morning. morning. No, definitely not. Wow. Yeah. So, so they they were just so different. Uh, Heidegger wanted to understand the world from top down, and 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 Heid and Hartmann was trying to understand it from bottom up. Uh, and the whole existentialism uh, kind of seemed to pretend that we can understand the world starting with human beings, even though I think Freud and and psychoanalysis should have uh, uh, told us that that even though we are the most accessible to ourselves, by no means are we the most known to ourselves, that there are too many dark secrets and and unknown things about ourselves, even though those are our psychic events and and processes and so on. So there's this fundamental difference. So Hartman says, let's start from the beginning. Uh, Let's start from the world that's there without Mm -hmm. us, that's not being impacted by us. Um, uh, The world, the world is just there. Obviously, we are. Uh, we can do some damage to that world, as we have done with the environmental uh, uh, disasters looming above us, and 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 nuclear weapons uh, uh, ready to to be used by at least certain members of our community, including some of those in England, as you know yeah, what I'm talking you know, about. She's, she's ready to push the button. If, if she I is mean, ready, it's a she, big. That's a big thing to say, and I mean that's a. Uh, yeah. That's a, an, I guess, an ontologically determined position, right? Like it's a justified position that there's a there's a deep ontological belief in a right and a reasoning and a rationality that would bring that about. I mean, it's a completely it's not passive, is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Hartman had an approach. That's another occasion, maybe to 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 clarify it a little bit. Uh, Hartman was opposed to big movements. Uh, Hartmann was opposed to, maybe because he lived in Hitler, Germany, he could see what big movements do to people and how they can seduce people and what can they seduce people into, right? Uh, Hartmann thought that my task as a philosopher, as a human being, is to try to fix my own life as much as possible, try to find a way to fit in, find a way to build my own personality, find a way to help my neighbor be a brother as much as I can be a brother and, and help about certain things that I can help uh, with rather than to think about how do I fix the world and whether the use of the nuclear weapons would be justified if those mean evil Russians uh, threaten our existence or, or, or anything along those lines. Uh, so Hartman was very much opposed to these these sweeping changes and big movements that promise to change the world to the better and fix the world into utopia that we are all hoping for. Uh, He was kind of looking at it from a very pedestrian point of view. 
Am I even able to fix my own life? Am I able <laughs> to bring my own life in harmony with, with the basic impulses of my humanity and the unique drives and aspirations of my own individuality? Uh, which uh, which is also against the spirit of time, right? We we all had big pronouncements to uh, to do, like uh, um, um, uh, what is his name the, from the Frankfurt School School that poetry or art is impossible after the Holocaust uh, or philosophy. Adorno, 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 Adorno. Uh, so so Hartman shied away from such big things. The Holocaust was a human catastrophe, but it's just one of really many human catastrophes. Uh, um, so why make these big pronouncements like that? Uh, of course, they are popular and catchy and, and they can uh, improve the sales of your books and so on. Uh, but, but they are so kind of either dishonest or unreflective from Hartman's point of view. So, so Hartman had this kind of pedestrian approach. He refused to for instance, buy a car and own a car. He went to his uh, work. He he lived outside of Berlin, but he would ride a bicycle and and go to his work on bike. Uh, so the kind of pedestrian approach. What can I do about my own life, about my immediate mm. environment? What can I do with my students? What can I in, in not not kind of can I can I share? Some of my insights and and some of my knowledge with them, not trying to fix them or make them believe in mm. them like dogmas, but just sharing my struggles, the philosophies about relating to the world in an honest way, in a thoughtful, honest way. Mm. And the best we can do is not expect to fix the world, but share our honest struggles with other human mm. beings, share our hopes and aspirations with other human beings. Uh, so, so that's... I mean, that part of Hartman has a very strong appeal on me, I have to say. And, and I'm also against these big sweeping movements and uh, expectations how if we just elect Donald Trump again, uh, he will make America great again and, and things like that. Uh, I've seen enough. I've lived long in, <laughs> uh, in this country and uh, in the former Yugoslavia to, to know better. Mm, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, so, I mean, that that whole idea, though, of, I guess, not passivity in the sense of not doing anything at all, but that passive voice. And it seems Hartman there, you know, with the, the, the idea of not owning a car at the point where the masses are being drawn into this sort of horrible behemoth of automobile culture, which now people is so ingrained that we just ignore it, right? It's an assumption, uh, even though that the, the our entire world is based around these horrible things. So, he's, he's, his ontology is almost an ontology of, of against any interjections, against sort of, you know, marching in and saying, right, here's our flag, here's, here's I'm drawing the lines, I'm drawing a border. So, this implicitly perhaps doesn't remove a teleology, but it puts teleology takes teleology you know in the words of kant takes teleology to court right it's a critique of teleology so what is man what is man to do now well uh, let me give you one example from hartman's life that that will kind of illuminate some of the things we were talking about how it's an not entirely an activist attitude but not a passive attitude either and then i'll try to give a kind of a theoretical question to a theoretical answer to your question uh, what i mentioned in a book and what louis Weiback, my teacher related to me was that hartman was the only one of his teachers in Berlin in 1937, 38, who did not open his classes with Heil Hitler. That was a mandatory greetings at the university. Wow. So Hartmann was the only one. Uh, could he stop Hitler? No. Could he think he could stop Hitler? No. Could he stop Nazism? No. But he refused to open his classes with high Hitler. Mm. He knew that Hitler will ruin Germany and ruin the world, and and that this is a disaster. Uh, mm. But all he could do, obviously, he risked his career and his life. And what saved him, uh, according to to Beck, what saved him eventually, is that he proved his loyalty to Germany because he participated in World War One. Mm. 
Mm. Right? Before World War One, he actually had two citizenship. He had two passports, Russian and German. And he was asked before World War One to renounce one and accept and, and keep the other. And and him being a German, really hard man, right? Uh, um, he he and he was living in Germany at the time. He he um, he kept his uh, German passport, and then he was sent to uh, to the Russian front. Actually, like Wittgenstein, uh, he was uh, Hartmann was on the Russian front, just not an ordinary soldier. He was an officer in the in the German army. Um, he did not participate in fighting, uh, so that saved him. That he already served for for the fatherland, fatherland in Germany, and and proved his loyalty to the country, and and. Uh, which is not the same as the loyalty to Hitler, right, no. or the uh, National Socialism. So, so you see, this I, I can't stop Nazism. Mm. I can't stop Hitler, and I'll not try to kill Hitler to 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 change the course of history. But what I can do is not be a submissive part of that ugly mm. evil machine. Is it enough? Well, we can disagree about it, right? Uh, many of Hartmann's colleagues thought that. Hitler is so powerful that it's better for the time being to raise that hand and say, hi, Hitler, and not mm. mean anything by it and not support it, but just do it and not cause yourself any trouble. Hartmann couldn't do it, mm. right? So mm. so he, he made a stand. Uh, now to teleology. Uh, to answer your question metaphorically, we could say that Hartman thought that the journey is more important than the destination. That it, if we fixate on the destination, then we often bring ourselves to believe that any means is justified to reach that destination. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the use of nuclear weapons or bombing Ukraine or or, or whatever it, it, it is, or stealing or cheating or lying or, or you know, uh, um, plagiarizing or whatever it takes, uh, I want that goal. Hartman thought that it's the journey that keeps us honest. Mm. It's the effort, it's the struggle, first of all, with ourselves, first of all, with the impulses in ourselves, with the temptations that we experience almost every day to cut corners, to do this, to do that. Uh, so, and in that during that journey and in a way in which we we live that journey, that's where we kind of test and prove our dignity and integrity and moral being. Uh, in that journey, we show optimism or pessimism, hope or despair. Uh, in that journey, in maybe to use another example from... Uh, Victor Frankl, uh, man's search for for meaning, uh, his experience in a, in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. Victor Frankl describes um, uh, um, an inmate who every morning before going out into the mud into winter to work on wherever the Germans sent him to work, he would clean and polish his shoes, mm -hmm. even though the next minute the shoes would be as dirty his shoes would be as dirty as is 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 distinguishable as anybody else's shoes but in that act he preserved his dignity he in that act he says i'm still a human being they cannot mm. kill hope in me they cannot kill human standards in me i know they're gonna be dirty i know they're gonna be messy uh and yet I have, this is my act of freedom. There's not much more I can do, but I, I, I refuse to be reduced to level of a beast, mm -hmm. uh, which would mean complete victory for the Nazis, which would mean complete victory uh, for the evil. To, to repudiate your sense of humanity or your, your human dignity. It, and that's possible in that struggle. Uh, did that save the man's life? I don't know. I don't remember that Viktor Frankl says whether that person survived or not. And that ultimately is not matter. It's not about saving your life. It's about something that Hartmann and Frankl and many other philosophers, certainly those we are talking about, would say is more important than life, and mm -hmm. that's human dignity. Mm -hmm. Sort of that intuited, authentic, you know, I mean, I guess one might be able to say whether or not Hartmann knew Hitler, the you know the rise of Hitler was going to 
to uh, destroy everything and be as destructive as it was, whether or not he actually knew that, uh, I guess would be up for question. But that intuitive sense of, no, some, you know, something with respect to this collective spirit isn't right in relation to my personal spirit. I'm not going to do the Heil Hitler. And it seems there that there is that, you, you can see from that the importance of that idea of the spirit, right? And being caught up yes. in something else and whether or not, and I mean, this sort of draws in that idea, this idea of personality for, um, for Hartman. And is, is this really where the, the construction of something we could call authentic and genuine, uh, within the human being, even though that's not like, as you say, it's not about ends. Cause as soon as you have an end, then everything else is justified and you start drawing lines and you say, well, that's not in, accordance with the end, but it's like a, a, a journey-based authenticity in relation to what you intuit is right and wrong in relation to your personal spirit. But that's not a, a personal spirit, but not an individualistic spirit. True. You are just True. of ontology. You are just of True. being. And it's, these are very important distinctions that you are making and very important points. Uh, so personality, uh, is something that has to take into account both who I am as a unique being and that I am a human being. Uh, and the difficult thing about personality is to join the two together. Uh, there are many movements, uh, for instance, that only emphasize, many mass movements that only emphasize our humanity. At, or or our patriotism. We are the members of these nations, proud to be Americans or Englishmen or or whatever it is, Russians, whatever it is. And and so the general aspect of it. And in our society, as as you're well aware, we have this other tendency. Uh, I can do whatever I want. I if I were to have more hair, uh, or if you don't <laughs> shave your hair, we could paint them in purple, right? Or or you know, pierce ourselves all over, tattoo our face over, or mm. whatever. Uh, and it's not about this arbitrary um, expression of of uh, I can do it or I want to do it, and who's to say anything to me? But rather, kind of understanding belief in a certain human calling that takes into account what your specific gifts are, mm. who you are, and how you so you give expression to your humanity in a way that's peculiar to you and in terms of the gifts that are peculiar to you that you don't neglect uh, just because maybe your society does not appreciate it, right? So maybe you and I would have been better off studying economy or business and making a lot of money, but that's not what you and I are maybe gifted for, or interested in, and and if you're doing something that's useless or in the eyes of, <laughs> of many people in our society is useless, uh, but but this is who we are, and this is our way of struggling with our human situation and our human condition and the problems that are overwhelming, becoming overwhelming for each one of us. And, and yet trying to do it in a way that's honest and, and that's preserving that integrity and that's Maybe giving an example, uh, I have kids that that I look, I'm a role model for them, or I should be, and I'm trying to be a role model for them, right? Um, I have my students, and I should be a role model for them too, too not just in uh, showing them how I read the books that they haven't read yet uh, and how I can grade them any way I want, but in giving them an example of what it means to be a human being who believes in something, who trusts who has trust, who has noble ideals, who who believes that it's important to be a good human being, even if the economic disaster destroys everything we, we, we consider precious and dear, uh, including not just human life, but all life on this planet. And, mm. and yet you still have the struggle, you still have the task uh, of of living in a way that's appropriate for humanity and living in a way that's in accordance with who you are and what you can do about this life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that ties those things together. And one, one thing I do want to draw in, because I know you consider it overlooked even within Hartman scholarship, is in what what what's the what role does aesthetics play in relation to all that we've spoken about so far? Yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Um, 
Hartman did not uh, finish his aesthetics. Uh, he died before. And interestingly, he wrote his aesthetics during the siege of Berlin in 1945. And uh, Hartman was teaching his classes until February of 1945. He lived in Berlin at the time. The Allied uh, bombing destroyed the, uh, the university building, the Humboldt University, where he was teaching. So he didn't have anything better to do. So he finally could dedicate his life to aesthetics. So you imagine somebody, uh, 1945, Berlin is probably, if there was hell on this mm-hmm. earth, that was Berlin, right? The shortages of everything, no electricity, no food, water. Hartmann's writing his 700-page aesthetics about Rembrandt and Bach and Goethe <laughs> and, and beauty and sublimity and, and all of that. And Hartmann thought that... Aesthetics, perhaps more than ethics, even though ethics as well, shows our taste. And in, in, he even translated sapientia, uh, wisdom, right? The Latin for wisdom as a, as a moral taste, as a kind of cultivated taste. And Hartman thought that so much of our morality is tied to practical interest, that in morality we cannot show the full range of our humanity. And that sometimes in our admiration of beauty and our admiration of the sublime things, we kind of allow this humanity and the humanity striving toward the highest and the best to find the easiest expression and and to uh, get the food that it need that it needs uh, uh, so sorely, right? So practical life, Ethics included often forces us to do these various practical things to survive. Uh, but ethics kind of uh, aesthetics and art opens the way for us for what Hartman called useless values that he believed are the highest values. The highest values in life are useless values. And yet they are the li- they are the values that bestow meaning. They are the mm. they are the values that are connected with meaning. And 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 and, and so he he there's this book unfinished uh, that was published um, after his death. That that it's just incredible. Uh, you know how how you read about Rembrandt and Leonardo. And Dostoevsky and all of these great people when the when the world is falling apart around you and still important like that prisoner in Auschwitz cleaning, wiping his shoes and polishing his shoes, this hard man still thinking, even at a time when people are dying all over, it's still important to remember Rembrandt and to read a line page of Dostoevsky or to listen to a few by Bach or, or things like that, because that's that's the highest we can aspire toward. And that, that somehow he especially uh, believed that he himself was a very good musician, a cello player. Uh, and, and he believed that music is the highest of all arts, precisely because it's not representative as an art and it, it allows the pure spirit to unfold and takes us away into whatever sphere is not stained by the practical life and the decisions of human beings and the disasters that surround us. Mm-hmm. So the aesthetics is is in some ways it's easier to almost live your humanity and feed your humanity through the aesthetical experiences than through other aspects of life that are also important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So has, uh, has studying Harman's philosophy for so long, has it sort of uh, altered how you you personally live your life? Uh, I tried to uh, certainly. Um, certainly, if 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 I have to give a definition of what philosophy is for Hartman, I would say it's the way you relate to, to the world. It's the way you 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 relate to your own life, and so this this practical and theoretical components are very intimately connected. And I definitely try to do it in my own life. Uh, definitely, for me, philosophy is not my profession. It's my calling. It's my vocation. It's 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 what I'm called to do. And, and, and that's what I do with all my heart and my mind and every uh, energy, a- atom of energy that I find in myself. Mm-hmm. So with that energy, are you, are you still working on Hartman? Are you writing any more books on Hartman? 
uh, I'm not working on Hartman specifically. He's with me like fresh air is 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 with me. He's he's surrounding me. I'm I'm floating in the atmosphere filled with Hartman's ideas, but I'm not specifically working on Hartman. Um, uh, I'm retiring next year, taking early retirement so I can dedicate more time to reading and, and writing. I don't need more money, so why should I continue mm-hmm. to to work? Uh, Good. Uh, it, I have kind of three projects in mind, book projects, but there are many more. But the three that, that are kind of, I think, would occupy me the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. One starts with values, trying to develop a, a kind of... Um, talking about the allure of values, values as our aspirations, and trying very much to go against the grain uh, that I have to fight against with my students, how values are relative and how it's all subjective and how you can choose whatever you want and, and so on and so forth. So trying to show how values fit into our world and how important they are and, and how much of our taste is underdeveloped when it comes to values and not to speak about a certain blindness of values that's dictated by our practical preoccupations. We simply don't have time for 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 high values. Uh, another another book that I want to do that's also kind of permeated by Hartman, but not about Hartman, is about personality. Personality is a task. Developing personality, a little bit of what I was talking about earlier in combining the unique with the human, with the general human, in 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 developing who you are, but in a way that's very sensitive of, of humanity and, and 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 our circumstances under which we live. And the third is about would be uh, so Hartman would start with ontology and maybe I would go back to ontology as my last project or my last preoccupation. A kind of developing a kind of ontology that's based on interactions, that's based on intercrossing, that's based on overlaps rather than uh, the old ontology of substances, the old ontologies of there's this and there's that, right? Mm. Because we're constantly uh, um, living in a world with kind of porous boundaries, right? Both mm. as individuals as, as as objects. We are not rigidly defined in any way, nor is anything else rigidly defined. So trying to look at an ontology in a kind of a way that's dynamic, uh, in a way that's that is not so rigidly quantifiable and modeled after the ways of science. Well, even science, if you know much about modern physics or biology, even they are staying away from rigid things and rigid definitions. Is something a particle or a wave? Well, it's both. Well, how can it be both? Well, it just is. <laughs> uh, so uh, the world in, in an, an ontology in which contradictions exist only in thoughts and not in reality, uh, developing an ontology that in which things constantly merge into each other and change shapes and borders and um, uh, directions in which they flow and the the quality of energy invested into something, uh, trying to think along those lines uh, something big i mean that's a that's an intense retirement well, it's, it's in, intent to be the next good. 15 years of of very intense work i hope good i mean that's how it should be um so i mean i guess one one sort of final question is where would you advise people to begin with i mean i, I i'll say it i mean your your book an introduction to the philosophy of of nikolai hartman is fantastic it's an extremely accessible uh, the analysis of wonder um so that's the good secondary place to begin but if people wanted to delve into the primary work of hartman where would you advise uh depends on the uh, person's interest i would advise to go into ethics or or aesthetics first rather than into ontology hartman's ontology is multi-layered pluralistic, difficult, defies the ordinary ontological categories, uh, and it requires an enormous amount of time and energy to to understand and to master. And it turns many more people away than than in. Uh, So I don't think Cartman's ontology is the best place, but ethics... 
And and his ethics is written in such a way that one can just look at the analysis of four different kinds of love, for instance, or the four fundamental ethical values that Hartman considers to be the good, the noble, the pure, and the richness of experience. Or, or uh, so ethics doesn't have to be studied uh, complete. One can kind of enter into and and pick uh, for uh, oneself. Aesthetics, I think, should be read uh, in, in its entirety. Uh, it's it's really kind of a way of uh, helping us see the world in a different way. Hartman makes a distinction very important and early in his aesthetics between looking at something and looking through something. So mm. I'm looking at the screen and I see you, but I can kind of look through the screen and maybe recognize your mood and maybe the audience will definitely recognize my mood and energy and enthusiasm and 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 things like that so we 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 kind of intuitively going back to some of the things we were talking about recognize that the mood is peaceful or volcanic or disturbing or 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 depressing uh how do we do that so in art art helps us recognize various aspects of reality that are not practically relevant, right? Uh, We have to do this conversation regardless of whether your mood is cheerful or depressing or serious or or funny or whatever, right? Mm. This is the practical part of it. But it very much contributes to the quality of our conversation, whether uh, your heart is into it, whether your energy is into it, whether you are with me now Mm. or somewhere else because you have a sick child at home and you should really be there rather than uh, uh, where you are right now. Uh, so aesthetics, I think, sharpens and deepens our understanding of the world and perception of the world while also at the same time talking. Hartman talks about beauty in nature, not just beauty in art. So his aesthetics is, is not just about art. It's, it's about recognizing the beauty in anything we face. Um, he talks about artistic truths and and factual truths and essential truths and and the sublime and about the charming and about the comic and about the tragic I and mean, it's the rhapsody it's the ninth symphony uh, uh aesthetics is is hartman's what what the ninth symphony was for beethoven that's what the aesthetics is for hartman i think <laughs> hmm okay well, it seems like a good place to finish up. I mean, is there anything uh, key about, obviously, there's so much more on Hartman, but is there anything you'd like to add in uh, you feel is key that we haven't touched upon? Maybe this. I think that the, one of the biggest problems of our time is that we have given up on both realism and idealism. <laughs> in the earlier epochs, let's say Christianity of the Middle Ages, um, or early Christianity, you have idealism very strong, right? Uh, Jesus is second coming or whatever, the kingdom of God. But but the realism is is kind of abandoned. You, you ignore the reality of it. Or sometimes we have kind of pragmatism that's focused on, on kind of the real world that's abandoning all the ideals. We live in a world in which we have abandoned both reality and and ideals. We 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 run try to find safety into virtual world and virtual reality, and we have abandoned pretty much. We laugh at all big ideals, right? We laugh at any idealism. We call it utopianism or whatever. I think one of the key things that Hartman did for me was to show me that. Both realism and idealism are necessary for good, healthy, and meaningful life. That we, if if I can use a metaphor, we have to keep one foot on the ground and the other foot in the clouds. Mm-hmm. 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 I think, yeah, that seems like a healthy way. But I mean, that's always that's always passive, though. That's the difficulty. It's not getting caught, not getting caught up. And it seems not like, getting uh, caught up and. And being able to live in two worlds and and being able to give its due to to both the real world uh, and to the world of ideals and aspirations. How to do that, how to balance between the two, that's the mastery that that, that, that I think Hartman philosophy helps us with. Okay. That seems like a very good place to finish up. Uh, Predrag, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics. 
James, my pleasure.